of uh, things that we are not very much in favor of, we don't have to prove anything, you can send it directly. So certification, uh, you know the systems that we have to go through. So I'll explain a little bit about, about certification systems, what exists around the world. Uh, and then, then we can have some questions on that. And then Leo, my colleague, he will, he will take you through a set of uh, a presentation which, which looks at organic agriculture in the villages, how, the, how is that dead uh, being, how is, in the, last, in the last lecture we had a session on where we talked about products, uh, and you saw the final products as uh, photographs or slides. So we will, we will see what happens at the village end. You see the final product, but what, what effort takes place? What are the challenges at that level? What are the constraints at that level? What are the opportunities at, at that kind of a level? So he will, he will run you through that. And then, in the, then after tea, we have your presentation. Uh, that runs up to lunch. And then after lunch, we have a presentation by a group that will talk about fair trade. So again, last time we talked a little bit about principles of fair trade, we talked a little bit, but here will be an example uh, of how a design company, how they have led a fair trade branding exercise uh, in our country. Just over the last one year we've been doing that branding exercise. So how they will take you to that. Then excuse for today, that's that. It's an aside to the whole thing. 
organic agriculture combines traditions, very important view. We tend to think of organic agriculture suddenly that has, you know, it's an innovation that it has come up in the last 20 years. You know, it is not, it's not. Our own country has, has tradition which goes back hundreds of years. Yeah. And we need to recognize that. Okay. Organic agriculture maybe as, as the way we define it or as the way we understand it, maybe it's something that we have come up with all these definitions recently. But it combines tradition, it combines innovation. Yeah. And science to benefit the shared environment. Shared environment. Again, if you remember in the first in the first on the first day itself also we talked so much about that this environment is not just ours. This environment is something that has been given to us and it is our responsibility to be able to take this environment forward. So it's, it combines tradition, innovation, innovation and science to benefit the shared environment and promotes fair relationships and a good quality of life for all involved. It's not only good quality of life for all involved. What would all what would all mean to you? These are very cliche words. I want to hear something very relevant, very down to earth. What does all in what mean? Very quick, strong answers and words. But it is, it starts from down from insects onwards. For all in what it's not just people. So at one level, when we look at it, and we say that many times we leave out people when we are talking about health. But when we are talking about good quality of life for all involved, even here also, it's not only people, but it's also, whether it's your flora, fauna, whatever it is, it's, it's for everybody, it's their health and the quality of life for them, that is also important. So, if you look at the definition, it's a vast definition. Talk about fair relationships. Yeah. In, an, in an organic agriculture definition, <coughs> to add fair relationship means a lot. Yeah. Uh, you asked us to define or uh, to speak about what is this all. Uh, so my question is how does uh, you know, IFOM or any other organization? Try to ascertain what is good quality life of all this and how does it try to ascertain that? Yeah. See, if you try and answer that, we will we, I, we forget about all. Many of these things, how will you define? What is tradition? What is something 20 years old? Something 50 years old? Or something 200 years old? Is it relevant today? Was it relevant only at that time? <coughs> so, he is, so, the problem with organic agriculture or the way we try to define it is always that we try and crunch it and that's why I said it's very paradoxical that you know for organic agriculture we have to define everything. But if, you, if I had to put in chemical inputs, I don't have to define anything and I don't even need to label anything on the, on the product. That is that is the challenge, and so for us, and maybe when we talk about PGS later, we, we, we will we will talk a little bit about you know this quality of life, tradition, ecosystem, health, and I don't think there's an answer ready-made answer for that. And for us, I think we need to be aware uh, of the le local situation how people have dealt with it, try and understand that rather than try and impose from outside. Because then we will come with predetermined sets of ideas and theories which may work, which may not work. I mean, even if I hope to those who have visited some farms, they would have seen maybe what works in Satyamangala might not work towards Anegati side, just you know, the other one end of the city and the other end of the city. It might not work because the entire ecological conditions are different. So, <laughs> some of those things, let us not try and define. Let us not try and define. Because if you try and define, you will get into so many complications. Because this is a natural system. 
the axial system. It is it's got so many stakeholders and so many parameters to define. So there are only some that we can take. And if you look at organic agriculture, one is you no, know, one is this. In this, actually, this is a very broad definition. This is a very broad definition, and for for me, I feel it's a very beautiful definition because it has. This has come over me a few years back. The earlier definitions of organic were very narrow, were very narrow. But then they realized that if we go with such a very narrow definition of agriculture, what you tend to do is. You make a club of organic people. <coughs> I mean club in a very broad sense where you have exclusivity to that idea that you are talking about. And then when it translates into trade, it becomes very, very, it's a very high comfort zone because you are operating on conditions only what you have defined. Yeah? And you have given no chance to people to be able to define their local conditions yeah, to understand those. You come from a person from UP, a person from Tamil Nadu, a person from Northeast. How they look at their own local conditions very different. You hold entire genetic plates. Northeast you have Zoom cultivation. Tamil Nadu you have the entire uh, uh, our Kaveri basin. They are very different. Very different. So so we must give space for those things to to happen and to take place and for us to be able to and to say and to acknowledge very humbly that we cannot understand and break down this entire thing like an industrial process where we are constantly refining and defining each each end of it. So the more you break it down, the more you are in control of the scenario. But in this you are not. That's why, that's why I said very clearly up front, it said, it relies, it's not something you are creating all the time. There is, you are, you are dependent on many things. Like we talked last time also when we talked about honey and things and I <coughs> mentioned that this is nothing in our control, nothing within our control. So, so how, how do we deal with that sort of a scenario? Little bit again in our modern in our modern history of how we will define organic agriculture. If I would originally if I would have looked at it, I would have said it is done by everybody. Organic agriculture. Hundred years ago, before the industrial revolution, maybe everybody was practicing organic agriculture. But industrial revolution had its effects. And then that's where the need came up to be able to to separate it and so in the 1920s, it was one of the first people who talked about biodynamic agriculture. Maybe you can later, if you are talking, you can explain a little bit about biodynamic agriculture. Then we had Sir Albert Howard in the 1940s who carried this concept forward. Today, you have Indian we have 90 million acres and 55 billion worth of trade that's going on. Just yesterday I was reading right, close to 60 billion worth of trade. But 90% of this 60 billion of trade is in the US and EU. 90% of that trade is between just this. And I, I ask myself the question, when we are such a huge economy, we are, we, are, we are nowhere in this picture. We are nowhere in this picture. I am talking from a pure trade perspective. We have huge opportunity within our own country. And this year, every year we have uh, the biggest trade fair that takes place in organic. It's taking place right now. It's taking place right now in, in Germany. It's a place called Nuremberg. It's the biggest you can spend four days or five days and you will still not cover all the stalls of organic produce from all over the world. <coughs> and this year, 
2012 is actually the year of India. So every year they have a country uh, specific focus. And so this year is year of India. There's a huge celebration uh, going on there. Organic agriculture, what I wanted to talk a little bit about is a little bit at, a little bit at the international level. And we have this <coughs> International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movement, IFOM. We have the website also, ifom.org. Yeah. This is an umbrella organization. It came up in the 1970s. And Today it has got close to 800 odd organizations that are, that are members of this movement. It's an, it's, it's an amazing organization, also a very tough organization to run because it's a network organization. People are members and they have a work and so sometimes for people who are sitting to run the thing, it can be very difficult because you have you have an assembly which can give a direction and to run 800 people who are not only not from one country but is from across the world you have from places like bosnia you have places from japan who are you know technologically so de developed you have places from india with, uh, people from india who are so diverse and to be able to come to conclusions or to come to definitions and so that's why the iphone definition itself if you look at it is gone through tremendous discussion to be able to include this diversity that exists on our planet. And so this is based, this is based in Bonn, uh, Germany. Three things I think uh, which it does. And they are they are the pillars of this <coughs> this organization uh, the focus is on. One is International relationships, the basic standard setting body internationally, principles of organic agriculture it sets up. They are very powerful in the sense that for all UN bodies, for the EU, for the US to some extent, Japan, for all these and for many other new emerging countries and economies. They are the, the standards that they set, iPhone set standards. They are the basic bottom line for any, any, any country. So when India started its, when India started its, uh, the organic principles or the, the standards and when it wanted to bring it into under, uh, as a legal thing, what we, what we do is, what we did, is just take the basic standards of iPhone and import it into our own country and said, okay, here is something that we, we start with. The second thing, the organic guarantee system. I will not get into this in detail because it's, uh, it's very vast uh, and lots of circles and Venn diagrams inside that just to show the relationship. But what I want to tell you is because of the guarantee system that iPhone has created <coughs> that there is a market guarantee for the integrity of the organic claim. So when, when a person says organic use, it might be much easier if I am selling maybe rice or dal to say organic. But if I have to sell uh, a toothpaste, if I have to sell a highly processed item like a, like a cream or something like that, how do you define organic? You know, not only the ingredients, the whole process of it, whether the, the, the ethics of that is being managed, all that comes out of this standard setting that happens. <coughs> you have, again, you have a common, common standards, which are basic standards. So you, those are again very broad. It is when, and if you look at the definition, when you have to break that definition down or when you have to break the standard down, then in a local context you can come up. 
and if you tell me that I have to care for the next for the next generation, it places a huge responsibility on all of us. So if we are aware of this, I think a lot of things can change. That was basic principles of organic agriculture. Just, just I have touched about some of some of the things. Let us look at certification. So what could be a participation of this precautionary principle in life? It's organic or not? The examples of that. Application of precautionary, of the precautionary principle. If you look at maybe seeds, yeah. How if we convert, if we have the green revolution and everything comes down to two or three varieties, and we have lost all the others, I don't, I don't know what will happen tomorrow. Today, the same people who advocated the green revolution are also talking about seed banks. That's one thing that I can think of. Very crucial. Yeah. Third party certification. When we talk of certification, actually, for, again, for most of us, it immediately comes that we assume, we assume that certification only comes from third party. Somebody else comes, looks at us, decides, goes through our systems, our procedures, our management, and then and takes off things and says organic or not, or whether in the industry anything is according to standard. This is a little bit again of the history of the whole process that has happened. What happened is, in the 1940s, we had regional standards. Different regions, they had different standards that came up. Certification, organic certification became more clearer, more, uh, more sort of tangible in the 70s. And in, in the 70s, going into the 80s, a lot of it was just voluntary. People said that I am organic. When we had farmers coming into markets, selling directly to consumers, they said, I am organic. <laughs> now, it will become more complicated. Now we have government regulations, governments demanding. We have private standards. This is, this, is a huge, this is a huge field by itself. When people say, I am organic, but I am more than organic. Because I have added some conditions which are not there even in the organic. <coughs> and so you have one of the biggest brand the labels worldwide. There's something called Demeter. G E M E T E R Demeter. It's a private label. But if if anybody in the EU puts a Demeter label on it, it means it means tremendously. For a consumer, it is it's a private label. No government backing for it. How do you spell that, sir? T E M E T E R. T E M E T E R. T E R. If you put that stamp on your product, it means you've gone through a very rigorous system which adds on organic, adds on actually many more conditions that you would like to have in an organic. Uh, and after the beyond this, now today, over 60 governments have part of it have organic principles as their in, in, in legal form. Little bit, I would like to spend time on participatory guarantee system. I spoke last time, was the same group here when I spoke last time? Uh, not, not on 4th, but last year. When, uh, 
Mr. Chandra Shekhar and everybody was here. Well, that was for the first case. Yes. That was the first case, bro. So I had spoken on this participatory guarantee system. We have third party certification, yes, which is very necessary <coughs> to have huge trade taking place, very between countries, very between different areas, different parts of our own country. Maybe. But also, in many parts of the world, what happens is that trade need not be huge, trade need not be worth billions of dollars, it can be worth few thousands, few hundreds. And it can be between you and me, sitting in Coimbatore, and then do I need to put a certification table which comes, somebody has to come from Calcutta maybe to examine and you might have only maybe 5000 rupees worth of products. Who is going to pay that expansion cost of somebody flying or even coming by train, spending two days looking, talking to you, who is going to pay that cost? Sometimes it's not necessary at all. And so many, in many parts of the world, you had, you had systems which were very simple. Packaging, 
I don't know the basics of logistics, I don't know the basics of uh, hygiene to be able to deal with that. And if I in Satya Bangla, if I am able to deal with a local uh, uh, shop, is able to value my product, then I also, then slowly, I, it gives me time to build up my system to address a larger market. So, so there is there is place for both, but we must give place for both. Why don't we have our own standards in India itself? So you said that Bayana should be in a specific shape. It's like men doesn't have any control over nature. I'm not supposed to control the shape of Bayana. The, the problem is when when you farm in the U, you you are you are you are doing many more things to do this control of the shape itself. Obviously it is possible to custom the certifications all these things. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So that's where that's where and this this I'm talking about it's not not only something that happened in in small countries, it is not only something that happened in countries like ours, when we tried, so it, it did not have this level. It did not say, you know, now this is an internationally accepted term and system. Yeah. Ten years back, fifteen years back, when we wanted to sell our honey, when we wanted to sell our coffee, and we said it's organic. All we were saying was that we have records that from I have bought from you. I know you. That was the biggest guarantee. I know you, I know your family, I know your farm, I, I have seen it and I see what you do 365 days of the year. But so but also this happened in many many larger economies like the US and the EU. And there were many people who, who completely revolted against this entire certification system which was purely based on third party. Revolted against. And so you you had systems which were very simple, very local, very local. And so, you, so that's why you you, you see why why did this happen? It was to explore new paradigms of how small holders can access markets. That was the trouble. Small holders could not access markets because everything was was oriented in such a manner that it was large. If I had, and if I knew, sometimes I I see a, somebody is giving a presentation say organic and they show a thousand acres of wheat. I'm saying maybe it's organic as per the certification system. But if I if I apply the definition of organic, I'm at a loss. I'm at a loss. So how can these small holders and for I mean our own country we, we have millions of small holders. How can they access the market? We have to we have to be able to find systems that there was tremendous frustration. You have in the US, in the US, the word organic is, is out of the public domain. You cannot make a statement saying my banana is organic. You will be inside the jail. You can a person can claim it is organic only if your trade is below five thousand dollars. That's it. And in the US, five thousand dollars trade is small change. Because what what's your size of farms? Your small holding farms you will say is fifty acres, hundred acres. This is a small farm, fifty acres, hundred acres. They can do five thousand dollars. Otherwise, you have the US Department of Agriculture which enforces. And what do they do? When they, when they, in the eighties they they started this, they came to farmers markets. What we have our Mondays here. They came to farmers markets and they just talked. And they said, "Are you organic?" And the person nodded his head. Yes. And there was a fine. Immediate. You could not, you could not make a claim. So, for many people, this was frustrating. Just repeat that concept of five thousand dollars on a what basis? Sir? Is the U.S. Department of Agriculture has come up with that as the limit? That's maximum amount of trade. Yes. On an annual basis. On an annual basis. For 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 India, it will, it will be huge. For for small farmers who are half an acre or one acre of farm, but for a fifty acre or a hundred acre farm, it's nothing. 
what about all those proteins with the cell shocks like Walgreen and all of the rest? You have various big, big chain stores like Walgreen and all of yeah. So those are not considered to be organic. Right? No, so they, so, so how do they sell it there? Yeah. Oh, I'm asking you the question. Mm -hmm. So they change stores. Okay. Change stores. Yeah. See, so in the US and EU, the word organic is not in the public thing. You can get, you can use the word organic, you can use the word bio, you can use the word um, natural. natural. All this only, again, only if you have a third party certificate. It's crazy. Yeah. So they, they have created a system which, which um, feeds on itself. So I have created a system by which you know now I need to have inspectors, I need to have guys who will st set the standard, I, everybody will pay. So you for each person's salary now you have to budget it inside my certification system. I was reading through the article which you put up in your website, uh, 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 Mexico.com a lot. Uh, and the New York Times article which you put a link to. I, I don't remember it. In that it was mentioned on like Mexico and it was like it's massive organic farm. They brought it to all the stores in the US. They were all? All those big big you know, it's like big farmers actually. Yeah, 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 I now I remember it. Yeah. So when you have a frustration where you cannot even call your stuff organic, it has to be certified by third party. There was tremendous frustration. And so many systems across the world came up which were simple and this was the definition. This is just just over four or five years old. This definition. It says <coughs> participatory guarantee systems are locally focused quality assurance systems. They are based on active participation of shareholders of stakeholders. It means that it's not only it's not only a certifier, but it's also me as a farmer. How am I involved in this whole certification system? If I'm not involved, it does not make sense. And very importantly, it's based on foundation of trust, social networks, and knowledge exchange. It's again very big words we use here. But this is the basis. I have I have no method of measuring trust. I have no method of measuring trust. How do I deal with the network? The social systems that we build, maybe in a village or in a community, they have their own strength. And I think, very importantly, when we talk about the organic, if you don't have knowledge exchange happening, and certification is only I'm telling you what's right and wrong, then it's, for me it doesn't make sense at all. And so, Key elements in this, we talked about it that it should be a shared vision. Yeah, it should be participatory, it should be a learning process, it should involve trust, it should be transparent. It should be transparent. It's not something that I if I if I go and ask any industry, you've received a certificate for X, Y, and Z, can you show me your records? It's confidential. Immediately. So who has done based on what what they have checked? I have no idea. Sir? Yes, sir. And for the we find some stickers in the app in a sample of the form expected or the entire food or the all is always samples. Samples. See when you when you are doing even third party certification, uh, when you have large uh, Forget about large farms, means you know they have inspected that one farm, so only maybe a corner they have inspected. But if I, if I if I have 500 farmers in an area all holding half an acre, all I can do, so what they have created a system is called an internal control system, ICS, is they take 10% of these 500 farmers, which is 50, and in that also they will do a random selection and they will have a check at the farm. So what they basically rely on is your documentation of how you have maintained records for those 500 farms. If we uh, 
while one day PGS works, when you have short, short market chain. Horizontal. Uh, normally, when I'm mean, I just giving a very simple example, is when we make a uh, we make an organizational chart, we tend to come like this. Yeah, there's good amount of space to be able to do things like this. Well, I I'm not the beginning and the end. Yeah, there is space for things to happen like this. So for the farmer to be able to say something to the inspector the appraiser and for the appraiser to say something, for the priest to add something, the space for everybody. And that's that's more things than the other thing. No, the, the priest small I thought was in the Brazil scenario. But in India how does it operate is that as NGOs we can be part of it. I feel this horizontal we call it this horizontal requirement in the organization where the good process has taken place in most of the area. We try to you know, replicate the same thing in the we, we need not again do the groundwork and do the experiment process. Could be maybe relevant here like where if one firm has successfully completed the process and standardized, the same thing can be applied in the other form. That that is something what what I I said the same thing under this. If there's something that I have done and learned in my own farm, I can, when I am appraising the next farm, I can talk about it. You have a kosher standard. You have a kosher standard. Yes. Yeah. So the coaching they come. In 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 Brazil, I mean, I've gone and seen when a priest. Times and preaches, and when he talks about organic agriculture, it's like there's no way. Is 90% of the of, of his congregation has already shifted to organic agriculture. There, there's very little space. See, so this, see, it's tremendous amounts of peer pressure and and uh, that community that they have built around that whole system. Right? So now, if a person wants to jump out of it, he will have not only his neighbor asking him, also his priest asking him, why have you shifted? So it's, it's very difficult. So we said, we heard that in over AI, that uh, the organic growers will come and visit another firm, other person's farm and yeah. help them certify. Yeah. Yeah. Because they don't want to, they won't reduce the certification cost of hiring someone. An so that's that's what happens in PGS. That is that's what happens in PGS is that you will have farm appraisals taking place by your own group members with maybe an NGO person from. So as a farm owner, you can evaluate other farms. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is just a short history. I'll go through it very fast. In, in 2000. Six, there was between various issues into place. It was supported by the Minister of Agriculture, the FAO, and I hope supported this whole process. Again, very important for us in our own country is indigenous knowledge system and traditional crops. So you have this website which gives a little bit more. And now it has been launched by the government of India. What are the challenges and opportunities? For us, we will that if we can spread PGS across Asia, so that's that's our that's our home region. If we can our own similar groups and countries across Asia can take it up. Fantastic. We have to also look at value addition. Right now, we are just looking at crops. So, simple crops. But how do we can with value addition? To open market, have we news? Engage the government. Because Within the government also there is tremendous, so there, is, there is one lobby which is, because in India the whole organic certification system grew with the Ministry of Commerce, not with the Ministry of Agriculture. The Ministry of Agriculture was left behind, far behind. By the time they woke up, the Ministry of Commerce had set up the entire legal, uh, regulation system. So how, how do you engage the government? 
so they do not see this as a threat, but this, they see it as a process of moving forward. Support for PKs is to promote organic farming. And now we, what we are doing is we are working on stuff, wild produce, things like honey, beeswax, shikakai, how, how do we, uh, bamboo, how do we, how do we certify these? It just features logos from around the world. Yeah, from, uh, this is French, this is American, this is New Zealand, Brazil, yeah, in different parts of the world. Features India. Features India. This is, I, I told you that the American system, they cannot call themselves organic. So what, they started by just saying certified naturally grown. That's it. They do not use the word organic. But what they have done is they have taken the word transparency and really worked on it. They have put the entire thing on the web. You can look at their you can look at their website. Entire thing is on the website. The standards, the application form, who has inspected your form, what are your form, what are their comments, everything is on the is on the internet. In the post. You have the New Zealand example, <coughs> which is different, New Zealand is a small country, where the government realized that we have only a third party certification system, it doesn't work. So they invited that can you set up a PGA, which works with small farms. It's different ways of approaching the whole concept. I, I, I will end there, so that was just an example. Um, Yes, and the organic thing maybe you will talk about. Are there any questions? Any more? Sir, there is some what could be the typical internship space or an area? What could be the various rate for certifications in case of a PGU or third party certification? How much is it? It can, it, can be, it can be completely buried. PGS, I am not given. PGS is highly uh, relies on volunteering. Highly relies on volunteering. Because you are using NGOs, you are using your own peer farmers. We have not put a cost to their time. Even if it is 200 rupees a waste they get for a day working somewhere, we have not put a cost to that. And there are three of them sitting. There is a person from the NGO sitting. That itself adds up to maybe about a thousand bucks. We are not putting any cost to that. So many PGA systems, we, we do not charge anything to the farmers. But there are, in the US, they have said donation. And so farmers realize the value. They get fifty dollars, hundred dollars in their in their system. But in our own in our own country, if I if I call an Indian uh, certifying body, I'll pay at least three to four thousand per day. And that's just the cost of the person, that's just the time. And then you add your whatever the travel accommodation, the local transport, food, everything you add up. It might be very low for a you know, if they come for accommodation and local transport for a place like Kotegiri, if they have to do something outside Bombay or Pune or anything, I mean, they must just add up. It can vary. You have actually studies uh, by the FAO also. I can, I'll see if there is a web copy available. By somebody who's done in FAO, who's done a, who's done a cost uh, analysis of what it costs in a PGA system, and what it costs in a, in a third party situation. And they've done an example also from around the world. There's right now also a study going on also. Which is so the, the, the good thing that has happened is that it has, the whole PGA system, when it, when it, when it, when it, people started talking about it, I think the, the fantastic thing was how we presented it to iPhone. And if you present it as now this is the answer, you will put off many people. You will put off many people. Because the entire trade lobby will go against you. 
but that we have succeeded within five or six years that now iPhone accepts it at pass, as part of its organic guarantee system. And we say that this is an alternative. This is, this is, and this is not got all the answers. So I, I know under PGS, if I, I want to certify a thousand acre farm, I have, I have no clue, I don't want to do it. So when in India we want to do it, we say, if you are not a group, we are not interested. You may be a small farmer of three acres, but as an individual, as PGS, I would not like to deal with it. As PGS, I would like you to be part of a group, because that's we are, we are basing everything on that trust. I don't, I, know, I don't know you as an individual. You have 10 farmers around you who know you, who certify you. That's the best certificate that you can get. I don't need to certify you more than that. So different in, in the US, you cannot have a group. You have a, a farm which is 100 acres. And it's a small farm. So they have different ways. They have consumers coming in to look at farms. They give them checklists. They spend a day. They certify. It depends on, on which certification system you want to look at. Third party certification, they will knock you out. And uh, depends on the kind of uh, problem that, you know, kind of uh, deviation you have taken. Then they might say, you know, just one year, or they might say three years, you go through the entire process again. So normally for a conversion, it takes place the next three years. Minimum, they put 36 months. So it depends on your violation, then they can decide. In PGS, what we try and do is, we won't throw you out of the group. So we, won't, we won't certify your part, but you remain as part of it. I, want, I don't want you to leave the organic farm and start doing something else. I want to give you space to maybe change. If you don't want to change, then it's a different So it's a different <laughs> ways that people look at. Normally 18 months. Yeah, but um, we are now in PGS. They give. Initially, we started and we said because it was mainly led by NGOs, we said it's valid till it is not knocked uh, out. Yeah. But uh, the government has said that at least you put it three years or five years so that you know you you have a system that by which you can uh, have an assessment again. Let's see if we. That's it.